artists and welcome back to my channel. My name is Margot Halleck and I'm a professional artist and illustrator. And in today's video, we're going to be talking all about paintbrushes and all the ins and outs of what they're called, what they're made of, how they're supposed to be used, and all the nitty gritty details. So if you're a beginner artist, um, this video will be a great place to start if you want a handy guide. And if you're a pro, I still think it's useful to brush up no pun intended, on the basics. I'm also going to do a demo of different brushes from my own personal collection so you can see all the different effects and finishes that can be achieved with various brush shapes and materials. So if you want to join me on this little brush adventure, keep watching. So I've pulled out every single brush that I own. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to move from broad categories to more and more um, specific as we move along. I think it's going to make things a lot much easier to understand that way. I'm also going to remove um, or eliminate Asian brushes like this from this video because I don't want to confuse you. And I think that Asian brushes are a whole different category and style of brush. So for for this video, we'll be talking solely about Western style brushes because um, that's what I have the most experience with and I think it's a good starting point for this video. Okay, so let's divvy these brushes into our first two broad categories, which are long handle and short handle brushes. All brushes fall into one of these two categories. And basically, in a nutshell, short handle brushes are the brushes that are used or best used for smaller sized paintings. You're going to hold them, you know, around here, which is right above what's called the ferrule, the silver part right here. And these brushes are favored by watercolor artists, um, gouache painters, and anyone making smaller sized paintings because of that shorter handle. So you would hold it like well, there are many different grips like this, or some people hold them like that. It's really um, at your discretion how you want to hold it. On the flip side, long handle brushes are most commonly used for large format canvas or wood or um, wall paintings. So by and large, you're going to hold these brushes at the very end of the handle while you're standing back from your painting like this. Um, and that distance really helps with being able to see the big picture of what's going on on a, on a larger painting. So long handle brushes are generally preferred by, um, you know, oil painters, acrylic painters, or anyone creating um, art on a larger canvas or mural. So that's our first major category. And we're going to narrow down now even more. And it's important to know now that these next categories apply to both long handle and short handle brushes. But because I'm a watercolorist and most of my collection are of the short handle kind, uh, my examples are going to be mostly short handled brushes. So just remember that as we're looking at all these different options, um, you know, in, in the rest of this video. Okay, so moving down the line to our next category, after long and short handles, we have natural versus synthetic brushes. Natural brushes are made from animal hairs, and the best known one being sable which is also frequently used for making expensive fur coats. So as you can probably guess, um, the cost of a sable brush is going to be at the top end of um, pricing as far as budget is concerned. Then we also have brushes that are made from other animals, ranging from squirrels, badger, um, pony, goat, uh, camel brushes, raccoon, rabbits, uh, the list goes on and on. Now, your traditional old school artist will probably tell you that these paint brushes and sable in particular, especially Kalinsky sable, um, that those are the Rolls Royce of paint brushes and that the quality is incomparable to synthetic brushes, which we'll talk about in a minute. But in my um, opinion, in my experience, I think that with today's technology, um, synthetic brushes have gotten so good that 
Personally, I just can't justify the need to kill animals in order to be able to get really great quality brushes. If you're looking at a naturally made brush, you'll find the details of the brush, including in most cases, the type of animal that was used, will be indicated right here on the brush, um, on, the, on the handle. So right here, you'll see that it says Kalinsky Sable, and that is the top tier, and actually my only Kalinsky Sable brush that I have. But Kalinsky will be your top of the line, most expensive brush. And these very often go well and above, you know, anywhere from 30 to sometimes over $200 a brush, depending on the size and the brand. The type of animal that was used to make the brush will make the characteristics of that brush distinct one from the next. So for example, sable will be somewhat soft, but a springier brush, whereas let's say a squirrel brush will be a lot softer and have much less snap. And snap refers to, um, you know, when a brush is able to snap back to its original shape right after you use it. And that's generally a desirable outcome for a brush, but it really depends on what you're looking to do and what you're looking for in your brush. So a squirrel will be softer and will hold more water and maybe not snap as much, um, which, which is great for, you know, wet on wet and big washes of color. Whereas an ox or a badger brush will be harder and less absorbent, which is great, let's say for oil painting or if you want stiffer acrylics. So all of these animal made brushes will be available both in long handle and in short handle brushes for the most part. Moving on to synthetic brushes, which is what I use for pretty much all of my work. These are brushes that are made using man-made materials that are engineered to mimic the characteristics of animal hair brushes. So aside from being cruelty free, which is great, a lot of these brushes are also very convenient to use because they're less fragile and they're much easier to maintain than animal hair brushes. And guess what? They're much cheaper too. I would say you generally want to avoid using materials like acrylics on natural or animal hair brushes because they can be very harsh and they'll break them down very quickly over time. Whereas synthetic brushes will be much more forgiving and um, they're able to stand up to that kind of rigorous use and you don't have to baby them as much. However, just like animal bristle brushes, synthetic brushes also come with many different finishes. So some can be made to be very soft. Some like these orange Taclon brushes are stiffer, whereas these, um, you know, Princeton Aqua Elite or Escada Reserva brushes are engineered to mimic the very famous Kalinsky Sable. Synthetics are great for literally all mediums, whether you're an oil or acrylic painter, or if you're a watercolorist. Um, the key here is to make sure that the type of brush you get is appropriate for the medium you're using. So usually when you're shopping for your brushes, whether you're online or you know in store, you'll wanna read the product description to make sure that the brush was engineered for that type of paint that you're you know, planning on using it for. Okay, so that covers it for synthetic brushes. Now we're going to move on to brush shapes. And here's where it easily gets super confusing because there are dozens, if not hundreds of different brush shapes. But for the sake of simplicity, I like to think of brushes as belonging to one of two fundamental categories. So throughout my years of working, I've noticed that most brushes will fall into one of these two categories. Either brushes with a flat footprint or brushes with a round footprint. So if you look at a brush from above, what's the shape at um, the base of the silver part right here? Is it um, a very flat rectangle or is it a circle? And based on you know, the determination of one versus the other, it'll either be a flat brush or a round brush. Simple as that. So let's take a look at some of the varieties that exist in both of these categories. So I have both a square brush and a round brush. And we're gonna take a look at all the iterations and um, you know different variations that exist in both of these camps, starting with a square brush first. And again, this has a squarer footprint, not just the shape of the bristles, but the actual um, footprint from above is going to be a skinny rectangular or square type shape. A popular alternative to the typical flat square brush is an angled brush. So this one just has the bristles cut at a 45 degree angle. 
Then we have what's known as a filbert grainer, and this is sort of an offshoot of what's known as a typical filbert brush, which has um, a rectangular shape with the edges um, kind of curved, like a rounded rectangle. So this is what a typical filbert will look like. So similar to that rectangular flat wash brush, the first one that I showed you, but with those edges rounded to create a softer or rounded rectangle. Then um, let's see, this is another angled brush, so we don't have to put that on the table, we already have one. This one is called an oval mop, and as the name suggests, it can hold a lot of water and is great for creating huge washes of color. Um, and those soft filbert-like edges um, contribute to that. So this is another grainer that's sort of an offshoot of that square or flat brush, the first one that I have on the list. And lastly, on my, you know, my own personal collection, I have a fan brush, and this one I very rarely use. And artists, don't concern yourselves too much with the naming convention for these brushes, because I find that from one manufacturer to the other, you know, sometimes they'll call it a square brush or a flat brush, or there are different ways um, of naming these. So it doesn't really matter, academically speaking, what they're called um, or what you think they should be used for. It's really just a matter of testing them out and seeing what works for you and, um, and the kind of brushes that you want for your collection. So these are ones that I typically reach for, minus the, the fan brush, um, which is kind of funny. I'll show you in a demo a little bit later what I use that for. This is sort of a sampling of what varieties exist in my collection. Um, I will have typically a you know, range of different sizes. So for example, the angled brush, or you could also, like I said, call that an angled shader, for example. Um, I have that in multiple sizes. I also have um, filberts of different sizes and shapes, depending on um, the manufacturer, the style of the brush, and maybe the length of the bristles. So while it can easily feel really confusing and like there's so many different options as far as brushes are concerned, just remembering that these are all part of one general category with some slightly different stylings to them. So they each have maybe something a little bit different about the detail of that shape. That will help, you know, clarify things and not make it so confusing because very often when you go to the art store, you see all these brushes and it's like a big brush soup and you don't know how to, you know, separate them from each other. And so remembering that, you know, flat brushes are all, you know, that flat footprint, but with some slight differences in the details, that'll help, you know, kind of bring things into perspective and not feel so confusing when you're shopping for brushes. So moving on to the round brush series, these are a lot simpler because generally they look a lot more similar. So again, round brushes have a round or circular footprint if you're looking at the brush from above. So some common variations you might see are, well, this is a regular round brush, and then we have one with a much sharper tip. So you can see that tip comes to a very fine point compared to a brush like this one that has a much broader tip. And so these are not necessarily gonna be named any different. It's just um, a detail that you'll see when you're looking at the brush. Then we have, oop, let's try not to knock over all of our paint brushes. Um, so then we have another one that has, let's say, a broader tip, but longer bristles. Moving right along, um, one of my favorite types of brushes for detail work is known as a liner. And this again is round, but it's very long. It has extremely long bristles. And I'll show you in a demo what that can be useful for. Um, but um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very convenient brush and a lot of people don't know how to use them. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Then we have a smaller brush, so smaller in size as well as shorter bristles. And again, these are all considered round brushes, so the devil's in the details here. And last but not least, this is a detail brush, also can be known as a spotter, a short liner, it can also be known as a small um, round brush. So the naming again doesn't really matter so much as the intrinsic shape that it has. So let's demo some of these brushes, starting with the flat or square brushes first. So let's have some fun with these. Demoing is always my favorite part because we get to play around with these fun supplies. So I have a sheet of paper with two categories, just like we talked about. So square brushes on the left and round brushes on the right. And we're gonna start with our square flat brush. So this can also be known as a flat wash or a flat shader, many different names to um, describe this brush depending on the exact proportions of it. But for all intents and purposes, it's a brush that looks like a 
rectangle when you're looking at the bristles. So this one is great for creating large washes of color. So especially the bigger versions of this brush, the larger size brushes are terrific for building backgrounds and creating very smooth transitions of color um, on large areas. And you don't necessarily have to use that large flat area either. You can use the shorter or the, the edge of the brush if you want as well to create textures or interesting shapes if you're doing petals. I think it's terrific for things like cobblestones or even brick if you're creating textures on architecture. All of these can be done using this one brush. And getting back real quick to the concept of creating transitions, you'll see how if I, you know, add a little bit of water underneath, you can see that this transition, because of the shape of the brush, it just helps distribute the pigment very easily. So if you want to create a gradient, this brush will really help you with being able to do that. Next is the filbert brush. And so this one has um, a rectangular shape with the rounded corner. So it's like a rounded rectangle. And this one is very similar to the first flat brush that I demonstrated. Um, however, the tip, because that tip is rounded, you'll see that it has a less sharp edge when you're, when you're starting your brush stroke. Um, and again, you can use this for textures. So if you're doing fish scales or if you're doing textures on a roof, um, costume textures, things like that, very, very helpful as well. And you get some really interesting marks from this brush shape. And just like the previous brush, it's also very helpful. And I use it a lot for things like washes and transitions. Um, those are very, very easy to execute with this type of brush. So let's see what other kind of shapes we can create with this one brush. And very often it's really a trial and error thing and seeing what you can achieve as well as um, what brushes make your life a little bit easier when you're doing one particular thing on your painting. So some brushes make certain jobs a little bit easier, like the square or flat brushes are really, really good for those nice clean transitions. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit of a thumbnail here on the side to um, define what the brushes we just did are so that when we're looking at this at the end we'll have a nice bird's eye view of what brushes went with what brush strokes all right so next we have a angled shader angled or shader sometimes they're called one or the other or both um, so let's get that going and that's actually going to be very similar to both the above actually probably more similar to the first which is the flat brush uh, because it has those sharper corners so you'll see that it is very similar when I lay it down this brush is also a little bit smaller than the previous one um, but the really great benefit of the angled shader is that you can use that tip and really have a two-in-one brush um, where you have that large flat surface for your washes but you also have that tip that can give you those those details if you are lazy to switch brushes um, like I sometimes am so let's create a couple more marks some more blends let's see creating some square rectangular type shapes by pressing it down and lifting it up you get quite a variety out of this brush so let's um, quickly write down what the shape is on, here on the side. So this is an angled brush. I'm gonna create a, a funny little angle right here. Um, and then we're gonna move on to our next brush, which is a grainer. And the grainer comes in a lot of different variations of shapes. So it comes as a rectangle or flat brush. It comes as a filbert. It comes in lots of different shapes. And so um, I call this my texturizing brush because it's great for creating line works, textures. If for example, you're creating a wood grain or you want um, a texture like this. So many instances where you could use this for grass, for trees, foliage. Um, it's a very convenient brush to have. And the key to this is really just the fact that the tip of the brush has this serration. It's not completely uh, even on the top. And that's what gives it that interesting, um, that interesting finish when you're putting it down. Um, you can also use it on its side like you do for some of the other brushes that I showed you. But generally speaking, this is a brush that I would recommend more for creating interesting textures with. So let me add a little thumbnail on the side with that little serration that um, this brush is known for. And last but not least in this little sampling of flat or square brushes is the fan brush. And this one is kind of funny because um, I don't typically use this for painting. In general, I actually use a fan brush for sweeping away <laughs> um, pencil markings when I've done erasing something. So I kind of call it my little brush broom um, because I use it, like I said, to sweep things away after I've erased them. So here's an example where um, let's just erase this little mark here and I'm going to use my fan brush like a broom to sweep 
that residue away. But that is not the intended use from the manufacturer's point of view. You're really supposed to use brushes for painting. Um, so let me show you what this looks like in a painting life scenario, even though I very rarely use it for that. Um, and uh, dip this in some water and get it going. And so this is a brush that I would consider really good for landscapes, trees, textures like grass, um, a little bit like the other brush above, except that because it fans out, you have maybe slightly less control of it than um, the other grainer brush that um, you know maybe has a little bit more restriction in movement. But, um, but you can get some interesting textures and shapes going on with this brush and some interesting marks if you decide to stipple it down like I am here. And this really becomes where you know your artistry comes to the forefront and how you want to use your supplies and how you want to use your instruments, like these brushes, to create the marks that you want to make in your art. So let's add this little fan thumbnail on the side and we're gonna be done for this sampling of square brushes. And like I mentioned before, this is by no means every single brush that there is out there, but a pretty good starting point to understand the kind of shapes and marks you can make with these types of brushes. So that is it for square brushes. We're gonna move on now to round brushes. So brushes with that rounder or circular footprint that I was talking about earlier. And round brushes typically from one to the next are quite similar, uh, barring a few that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the first one I'm gonna do is going to be your standard round brush with a sharper tip. And so the first one that I'm gonna reach for is by far my favorite brush as of late, which is Princeton's Aqua Elite in a number eight size. And one of the greatest things about this brush is because it's so sharp in the tip, you don't really have to change brush as much, um, you know, when working from one area of the painting to the next. So I can use the belly of the brush like I am here and get a very wide stroke versus just the tip and get a very narrow or even medium stroke with tapers and things like that. This is perfect for leaves for petals on a flower, for details on a figure. Um, it's really a, a great all-purpose brush because you can go from these very small, wispy and fine strokes to larger areas and washes of color. And while it might not be as effective as, say, a flat square brush to create large areas with transitions of color, you still can get the job done and get some really interesting shading and gradients going on. It's just not going to be as easy to do as with one of the flatter brushes. But if you want one all-purpose brush that you reach for and don't put down for the entirety of the painting, this one is the one for you. Next up, we're gonna do another round brush, but this one will not have a sharp tip. And you're gonna see the difference in line work and how different it is to work with something that doesn't have that defined tip. So let's create that little thumbnail on the side and kind of create a, it kind of looks like a filbert. However, because the barrel of the brush is round and not flat, then the effect is very different. So let's get this paint started. And I just realized that my right hand column with the round brushes is all warm colors. And then the other side with the flat brushes um, is all cool colors. So something I didn't realize I was doing, but here we are. So when I set this brush down, I do not have as much of a taper as I can get with my sharper tip brush, which makes a lot of sense because the tip of this brush is not as sharp as the other one. So when you're creating tapers or even brush strokes, the line work is going to be thicker. It's not going to be as fine in the tip as you can get from that other brush. And so this brush performs really well if you want to do larger areas, if you want to do stippling with um, bigger sort of circular shapes which would be hard to do with a fine tip. So let's say you wanted to do modeled textures on a tree or even polka dots on a dress, this brush would be a lot more effective in getting those dots or even those wider shapes than a very narrow and fine tip, which would just create a very small kind of like pencil-like mark. So if you want these circular or blurry um, organic shapes on things like trees or shadows, then this one is a really great one to try. Moving on to our next brush, um, we're gonna try one now that has perhaps longer bristles so that you can see what that would look like. And so I'm gonna pull out a liner. And a liner is really well known within the graphics um, and typography worlds because these brushes are really stable and really great with being able to create non-jittery straight lines, which as you can guess, if you're doing lettering or something where you need your hand to be extremely still, those longer bristles provide a little bit more margin of error in case you're feeling a little jittery or had maybe a little bit too much coffee. So just to show you the difference between this liner brush and maybe a brush with shorter 
uh, bristles. I'm just reaching for a brush of similar size. Um, and I'm going to show you how much harder it is to achieve a straight line with a brush with these shorter bristles. So I'm going to try as hard as I can to eliminate the jitter from my own hand. And I have a pretty steady hand, but you'll see how much more difficult it is to do that with a similar sized brush that has shorter bristles. So today's a pretty good day. Um, not too jittery, but as you can see, it's still very difficult. Even though I can get a somewhat straight line, it's not as easy for me to maintain the same thickness throughout. Um, and again, if I've had coffee or if I'm a little jittery, then that line will be a lot more difficult to maintain. Whereas the liner, you can see I just go one sweep and keep it really nice and even, which is great for um, detail work, archy lines, um, anything where you want a nice, smooth um, and very even line work. And I have to admit, this is the brush that I have the most fun with because I just feel like it's got my back. It's, you know, it's really going to do a lot of work on its own by keeping that line, line work really consistent and beautiful and elegant. So next up, we have a shorter, we actually just demoed this, but a brush with shorter bristles and that is of a smaller size. So this one is a pointed brush and it's a little bit smaller as well as has shorter bristles. And this one is really good for control, but of tighter areas. So if you're doing details on a face, intricate areas in architecture, like the details on a window pane or the doorknobs or things like that, where you want your brush strokes to be smaller, shorter and really an emphasis on more detail work this is a great brush to have and I'm actually going to link all of these brushes in the description below so if you want to look them up you can do so um, this smaller brush also can do smaller areas um, or washes so if you're doing you know a, a smaller area where you want uh, a gradient or um, transitions of color you can do that but again it's going to be tighter and smaller we can also do some really effective little mini polka dots with this one too so it's actually quite versatile. So moving on to, I believe this is the last brush in our round brushes series. This is going to be a very small detail brush, also known as a spotter um, detail or miniature brush as well. And this is where you get really tight, as in details on eyelashes. I use these for all of my ballerina faces, for example, when I'm doing lips or all the features, the jewelry, um, you know, just smaller details. Details. and this one gets extremely fine and generally speaking I usually recommend working from as large of a brush as possible to smaller and smaller as you go because the last thing you want to do is start with this brush and try to do your entire painting with a tiny little brush like this because it's gonna get really tight and it's gonna get a little bit lifeless if you do so so I was always taught to reach for as large of a brush as you could actually handle for what you're doing um, and then as you work your way into to the details of the painting, you can you know, allow yourself to go smaller as you go. And that's gonna keep the expressiveness and the life of your painting and not allow it to get too fussy and overworked. So I think that about wraps things up and you can see just the wide variety and um, breadth of different types of strokes and marks you can create with just these few fundamental shapes. And like I mentioned before, there are so many offshoots of these, but these are some of the you know nice tried and true um, basics that you'll find pretty much anywhere uh, to get you started on your journey with the brushes and to understand them a little better. And remember artists, it's all about finding the things that you like to work with and the types of marks that you like making. So I might like, you know, a round brush, but you might prefer a square brush and the marks you can make with that. So it's really a journey of discovery and experimentation. So that wraps everything up. I hope this video helped you and gave you a little more clarity about what to expect from, you know, synthetic versus natural brushes, long versus short, flat versus round. And if you feel the need to come back to this video to reference anything, I've added chapter markers below so that you can easily come back and get a refresher on everything we talked about today. Um, if you have any questions, leave them below. I try as hard as I can to answer every question that I get. So don't be shy to leave me a little notes so I can help you out. As always, thank you so much for watching and joining me every week, and I'll see you next time.